Good morning, this is Cody Hendrickson. Today we're going to be looking at recursion and how we can actually use it to solve problems, specifically in mathematics, and how it approaches things in the real world. The first thing we're going to do is when we look at recursion, we're going to identify some of the key concepts we have to make sure we are understanding before, as we finish this lecture. So there's a couple of vocabulary words you want to make sure that you identify as you listen to this. If you haven't been able to identify and define these words by the end of the lecture, go back and rewatch it again. First one we have is obviously recursion. We have a couple of terms that go along directly with that, which are the base case and the recursive case. We have some issues with problems we have to deal with, which are the infinite case, stack overflow, and integer overflow. So watch for those as we go through this. We'll be seeing them and what happens to them. And make sure you can understand them by the end of the lecture. The first thing we're going to look at is the actual concept of recursion itself. Now, you've probably often been told that you can't define something with itself. However, if we look at the New Hacker's Dictionary for the definition of recursion, it says that recursion, noun, see recursion, which causes a loop that continually calls itself to over and over and over and over again, always looking for that same thing so we never actually understand it. Now, if we use that kind of definition for recursion itself, of course it doesn't make sense. But we actually, when we're doing recursion, we are using it something to define itself, but we use a modification of that thing every single step. And so we do define something with itself. And one of the things we have to actually identify is that every recursive solution can actually be done in an iterative fashion, aka we can use that same solution we use with a method call. We can do that same thing using loops. The benefit of recursion is sometimes that there's a very nice potential for elegance of a solution. We can make a very clean and short, very easy to understand answer, as well as have the fact that we can um, have a very quick to result answer. However, that same benefit of elegance and quick to define can often be overwhelmed by the efficiency and or the speed of the solution for that. Sometimes those uh, quick and nice solutions don't actually execute very well because of the structural ideas behind that. And we'll see that when we take a look at the Fibonacci sequence. First thing we want to identify when we're looking at a recursion is the idea of the base case. This is when we stop recursion. We have to actually make sure we stop. If we don't have a base case, we will actually cause an infinite recursion because we'll never actually stop calling the same method over and over and over again, which causes the stack overflow. But we want to make sure we um, have that. This has to be a reachable condition, and this itself is going to be based on the parameter of the method. At what point of the parameter do we actually stop recursing? So you, what I do with this is I always make sure it's the if test. So when I know as soon as I hit that, hit that point, then I'm automatically at this place. Otherwise, I'll go back and recursively call until I reach that point. But the base case is when I stop. In the case of some of our sequences, we're going to see that usually being 0 or 1 for if I'm not in factorial. For other methods, it's when do I get to the point where I'm at a length of a certain size if I'm doing a drawing-based recursion or when I've reached a border for something else. The recursive case is the other side, the else of my condition. And so the else right there is like, what do I do when I, if I'm not at the base case, what do I do then? And that's when I call that same method again. The big idea though is that I'm calling that same method with the parameter that's been modified. In most cases, I'm using a, a smaller version of the parameter because I'm taking that one big problem and shrinking it down to a smaller component. But sometimes we're actually taking the problem and adding another piece to it until you get to the big part of the picture. But the, again, the idea is I'm continuing that recursive process until I get closer to the base case. Recursion should get us to the point where we are eventually going to hit that base case. If we never hit that base case, the recursive case keeps calling itself over and over and over again. Again, we reach that problem of having a stack overload because it never stops doing it. We look at the structure for that. The structure for recursion, especially in Java, is simply a method with parameter or parameters. We have inside that method an if-else test. Now, for me in my class, I always use the idea that the if test on that will always be the base case and the, um, for that if. And so the if is, I match this parameter, if that condition is met, then I am done and I simply return the associated value or object for the correct condition. However, if I have not passed that ba um, base case condition or test, then I need to have my recursive case, aka the else option. And in that case, I'll return some value plus subtract, divide, modify, add, whatever, to do the recursive call. And so I'll have the parameter plus a recursive call to the same method, but with a modified parameter. Again, so that modified parameter will eventually make it so that I will reach that base case. And what that does is as the base case continues to call itself, call, 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 when I reach the base case, I then come back to the previous answers going back up the stack of the actual system. And so we make sure that we, that recursive case continues to happen so we can reach that base case eventually by going back up the stack to build our answer from those little pieces we left along the way. When we're looking at factorial, factorial is the um, mathematical uh, system where we see that the number factorial is the product of all the numbers previous to that up into including one. And so we have that um, on that system. We can see right here that it has a very quick growth rate. Zero factorial is one, one factorial is one, two factorial is two, three factorial is six, then four factorial is 24. So we see that growth rate going from a mere constant level of, of growth with um, zero and one 
to linear growth with 2, to 6 we have it almost squared, to 4 we have greater than squared, 5 we have almost cubed, 6 we have greater than that by 10. We can see we're way past 10 to the fifth power simply at the tenth step of, the, uh, of that solution. So the factorial growth rate grows really big really fast. And we want to take a look at that. We can see that as an iterative solution is simply going to be a collection of looping over the variables, adding that value to its, um, the multiplication of the previous number times itself, times itself, times itself. Of course, making sure we either start at 1 and end at n or stop at, start at n and end at 1. The recursive solution, however, we can also see is a very clean, elegant solution where we see that n factorial is simply n times n minus 1 factorial. Very quick, very clean, and the entire solution is contained within that line. As you can see right here, we have, we're using some latex to actually identify that right here. So the factorial of x is 1, where x is 0. And otherwise, it's going to be the product of, from 1 to n, of that value all the way through it. And so we have the idea that we're going to keep with that. Now, to see the code right here, we have a Java method to actually go through factorial. Again, you can see that I have a guard in my code against some incorrect input in case someone types in a value that is less than 0, because we can't calculate something that's less than 0 for factorial. So I return an integer min value, so automatically just forces that to drop out of the system. However, if we don't have that as a problem, we go to our base case. If position is equal to 0, then we're returning 1. Otherwise, we're going to return position times the get factorial number of that modified position. As you can see right here, I'm taking my original parameter and then calling the recursive solution again with a modified parameter. So I'll continue going down until I reach that base case, in this case of 0. So we have our method right here with an if and else. The if test returns a value for the base case. The else returns a value times, in this case, and then a method call again. The Fibonacci sequence is a really cool nifty sequence we see throughout nature and in fact even in geology and some other uh, things of astronomy as well. You can see it in the Milky Way galaxy, snails, flowers, shells, all sorts of cool stuff. But the Fibonacci sequence that we see right here is actually a more complex solution than we saw with the idea of the factorial sequence. If we look at the little chart below, we can see that index 0 has a value of 1, 1 has a value of 1, 2 has a value of 2. Pretty nice easy standard thing, same 3, 3, oh well, okay, no big deal. Then 4, 5, whoa. Because the Fibonacci sequence is the idea is the sum of the two previous ones. Obviously, the base case then is 0 and 1, because if you're at 0 or 1, you have a defined value. If you're not at 0 or 1, you have to go back to the one before and the one before that and add those together to get that answer. And that's where we can see the idea that the idea of 7 is that of 8 plus 3 is 21, 8 is 21 plus 13 or 34. So we have that sequence that's building up. It does not build up nearly as fast as the factorial sequence does. However, the idea of the Fibonacci sequence is it's very complex on the back end side, which we'll see in just a moment. So we look at the iterative solution. If the iterative solution, we have to keep track of a few variables and we loop over them, having them so they add the variables together and then swapping them back and forth. So we continue going back down through that. Over the recursive solution, again, quick, elegant, nice and easy to see that Fibonacci of n is equal to Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci of n minus 2. Very clean, very elegant. We have that um, represented using the latex formula right there. So we can also see that for any other value like that. We can see the structure for that formula again where it's 0 or 1, it gets the value of 1. Anything greater than that is returning that value over there and using that with non-code, simply using math logic. Now we can see that here in code. Again, we're using that defensive code to guard against the um, incorrect user input, whether that user is the computer or some other part of um, someone actually typing into the program, where we return the integer up mid value. So it'll force break us out of that. And again, our base case, if we're at 0 or at 1 in this case, not just simply a single base case like we saw in factorial, but we have a compound base case, position is either 0 or position is 1. We return that 1 value because that's when either of those values have a 1 value for it. However, if we're at the recursive case, we have not finished with this. Our recursive case goes back in, and we can see we're going to call that Fibonacci number of n minus 1 and n minus 2, and we add those values together. And at this point, this is where we see the tree of calls happen to get so big so fast. This is what makes a Fibonacci, <clears throat> this is what makes the Fibonacci sequence go so slow with a, a recursive solution because every time that call happens, it builds and builds and builds and builds and the tree gets wider and wider and wider and wider. It's calls that have two calls, that calls that have two calls, and each of those two calls have calls, and each of those calls have two calls, all the way down until we reach a call of zero or one. And, and until we get to that point of zero or one, that doesn't remember any of those things, it's not smart enough to keep track of it unless we use another um, way of tool like dynamic programming or some other cool nifty ways of doing some recursion sequences where we understand what we've done before. That keeps building, 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 and it takes forever to calculate because it takes so long to process all those tiny little calls because it doesn't remember that it's already processed that call a few minutes ago. 
So we want to make sure on this that we uh, we look at how long it's going to actually take to do that. And we'll take a look at that in some other lectures and stuff as we look through the idea of recursion, how we can do some more further examples with that. But because it keeps going on like that, we have that recursive call plus the recursive call. And again, in this case, instead of affecting the original value like we saw with factorial, the Fibonacci sequence keeps just calling back those two previous calls. So it doesn't always have to refer to the individual parameter itself. It can simply refer to compound operations or operations on the previous parameter. And so because of that, we want to look at the idea of overflow. Overflow is what happens when we have a problem with some of our code. Now, the first thing of overflow that we get is the idea of type overflow, and that happens with factorial very, very quickly after 17 because it gets so big so fast. You saw that 10 was ridiculously huge. 17 gets past 2 billion. So we can't even grow oh, that. So that, that grows so fast that we overflow in energy, we start getting negative numbers, which doesn't work. And the double type will hit infinity, so it goes bigger than 10 to the 306 power that fast. 160 is not big, so it gets so big that it's bigger than 10 to the 306. That's a lot more zeros than you need to ever worry about. And that's for the idea of a type overflow. It gets so big we can't count it anymore. On the other hand, we have stack overflow. The stack overflow we've already mentioned again is where we have the idea of infinite recursion. That those calls that we put, those calls to recursive method, which are calls to recursive method, which are calls to recursive method, we don't hit that base case. We keep calling and calling and calling and calling. And that keeps on calling until our processor can't handle anymore. And so it just says stack overflow. And this is generally because we forgot the base case. So you want to make sure you always have that base case defined, and that's why I always do the base case as the if, and I make sure that when I write my recursive case that the modification of the parameter will always lead to a base case happening. So if my base case starts at 10 and it needs to get, is at 10, and I'm starting at 0, I'm always going to be adding numbers until I reach 10 or above. So making sure that you always have a way to make that base case happen. Now, there are some ruled examples to the idea of recursion. One of the first ones is the Matryoshka dolls. These are the Russian dolls you see often, cartoons, TV, etc., that look like this. They're cute little dolls that stack inside each other until you get to the very base case. So that each doll has, a doll has dolls inside, which has a doll inside, which has a doll inside, doll inside, doll inside, doll inside, until we reach that little tiny doll, and that's the last doll in the sequence. We also see recursion when we're looking at browsing computer folders. Here we have an example of my hard drive where I'm looking at my documents folder. I went to my Swift projects folder and my Swift projects folder, my Silly Afternoon project, which has inside Silly Afternoon, I have a bunch of different projects and folders attached to that. And that recursively looking down through the folders, looking down through the folder, looking down through the folder until I reach the base level folder. And we're Silly Afternoon Xcode Proj is the root level of the document in that file. There's nothing below that. And so we have that recursive solution as well. The other way we see this in world is in Boeing scores. We can see right here on this Boeing score in that first frame, it has a score of 20. That's the first frame. There's only 10 pins to hit. But the first, the score, because I achieved a strike, the score is equal to the sum of that score plus the next two rolls. In this case, it's 10 plus 9 plus 1. Because I reached a 9 on that first score and I got a 1, which gives me that next score. So that score builds on the following scores of it. So if I have a strike or a spare, my score is built on the following scores after that. And that's how you have a, a full game score of 300 with only 10 frames because your score builds in the following two scores. So re the recursion itself is seen in the real world. There's lots of examples for it. Then we'll continue working with that. To take a look at that, we have some things coming up that use recursion. One of the biggest things with recursion is the idea of sorting and searching, especially when dealing with trees. We have a tree traversal, and then we'll look at that on our B-Day classes for the computer um, data structures class. And then also when we're dealing with stacks, we often use recursion with that. So data structures especially use recursion when we're dealing with it, especially when we're looking at the idea of looking for or finding values when we're doing types of searches because the divide and conquer algorithms are recursive solutions. Thank you again, and have a great day. We'll see you next time.